Clark, we will uh, move on to the main focus of tonight's uh, meeting, which is to see the House debate the motion, this House believes New Labour is dead. Uh, to speak in proposition of the motion tonight, we have Jeanette Arnold, uh, Chair of the London Assembly and an Assembly Member for Hackney, Islington and Waltham Forest. And speaking alongside uh, um, George Walker, a student debater and the President-elect of the Durham Students' Union, very kindly stepped in for Mr Stringer, who unfortunately could not attend due to a family medical emergency. Uh, and opposing the motion this evening, we have R Ria Bernard, uh, the National Chair of the Young Fabians, and Mr Matthew Doyle, a uh, former political director for Tony Blair. So, without further ado, I will ask Jeanette Arnold to please open the case for the proposition. Good evening, Mr President, officers, members and guests. I'm honoured to have been invited to the debate this evening and I'm delighted to speak for the motion this House believes New Labour is dead. Having, seen, having been such a dominant political force in the United Kingdom for the period of almost 15 years, isn't it strange we could now be suggesting that New Labour is no more? Consider this. New Labour and its standard bearer, Tony Blair, delivered no less than 418 seats at the 1997 general election, the most seats the party has ever held and the largest proportion of seats held by any political party in the post-war period. In September 1997, Tony Blair enjoyed a 93% public approval rating. Indeed, his and New Labour's star were hardly um, less diminished um, in 2001, when they enjoyed a second landslide, egged on by all things, the Sun declared on its front page, it is in the back, Tony, you might as well call the election now. So complete seemed New Labour's dominance that some even began to consider seriously that Blair's third way revolution had retired the Tories for good. Indeed, in his 2005 book, the strange death of Tory England, Geoffrey Wheatcroft um, bemoaned Blair's great skill at adopting the more attractive economic aspects of Thatcherism while jettisoning her hostile social attitudes. Um, Blair argued that Wheatcroft had taken the meat and left the Tory bones. How distant that all seems now, with nobody to make the case for the third way. New Labour acolytes within the Labour Party marginalised, and Jeremy Corbyn and John MacDonald, who two of the party's socialist group uh, campaign groups, most long-standing and bitter critics of Blair, now at the helm of the Labour Party and delivering the kind of electoral result that no one thought possible. Yes, Labour is dead. Of that there can be no doubt. The real question is what or who killed New Labour, and what lessons the Labour Party can learn from this state of woe. As one of the 5,000 uh, Labour, um, 500,000 Labour Party activists out on the streets for the 1997 election, no one was more delighted than me to see a Labour victory. But beyond Cool Britannia and the People's Princess, as time went on, there seemed to me to be some problems. You could say, using a slightly different analysis, and one that might sit well with the current Labour leadership, that New Labour contained the seeds of its own destruction. Let me explain. Triangulation. It was notably demonstrated as an effective technique to secure votes during the Clinton era. It became the core New Labour approach. I would argue that somewhere along the line, it worked for New Labour in that they were able to gain power, but um, as it went on, I think many would argue, what did it do with that power? Now, there's no doubt that Labour achieved, New Labour achieved uh, much in government. It restored NHS funding to the European GDP average, um, all but wiping out um, waiting lists. Um, by 2009, the number of falling schools, that, failing schools had dwindled, Gay people could adopt and marry, it introduced devolution, crime fell. But with the successive majorities that it had, could New Labour not have been bolder still? What about the NHS? Could we not have seen lasting reforms? 
What about social mobility? Why did that slow down? And why were our financial institutions able to gamble with our money? New Labour also got some things badly wrong. And uh, I would then identify the case of the Iraq War. And um, I would also identify um, the introduction of uh, union tuition fees in 1998. Um, by the way, this is something my friend Jeremy Corbyn will abolish once in power, but I wouldn't want that to influence you here tonight uh, in any way. And, you know, I get the point. Um, if you earn more, um, that should be based on you being able to learn more. But um, my uh, position here is, where, what has happened to the principle of free education for all? Because that was the only way that we could increase university admission rates from lower earning families. So uh, it seemed clear to me that after some time, um, and we can identify the uh, diminishing number of electoral victories in Tory heartlands, also within uh, Labour's own um, territories, as you like. Um, one of the things that stands out for me is the way that New Labour dealt with this whole uh, issue of immigration. Now, clearly there are extremists everywhere, and we should not, um, if you like, um, uh, apologise for them in any way. But I believe that New Labour failed to understand that people are not racist when they want to talk about their concerns, and that was a big issue for me. And then let's just get to the war. Last week marked the 15th anniversary in what some call the greatest ever political demonstration in the history of this country. I think one of the things that really challenged and attacked and helped to bring about the end of new labour was the fact that two million people protested on the streets of the capital. That made no difference. There was an absence of an appropriate UN uh, resolution. That made no difference. The absence of definitive data about WMD made no difference. Robin Cook, a respected uh, figure within uh, the government, uh, resigned, made no difference. It seemed to me that what was going on there was that George wanted a war and his best friend Tony seemed happy to oblige. And so we then understand that uh, what people are then looking at now is what is this government about? And when they read then in The Guardian a devastating critique of Blair and the British government um, and the fact that Tony Blair to this day still defends his decision to go to war, this was a man who had claimed to be pretty straight sort of guy. Well, I preferred him when he, stu he stuck to triangulation. Moving on, and in 2017, we saw a man widely dismissed as being too radical be almost become the Labour Prime Minister. He delivered a net increase in Labour seats in a general election for the first time since 1997, 30 more seats than Miliband in 2015, four more seats than Brown in 2010, and the largest share of the vote since Blair's first historic victory. In fact, Labour, under Corbyn, hold more votes than four of the previous five general elections. So, Mr. President, officers, members and guests, in conclusion, new Labour is no more. I remember the heady days post the 1997 election when things could only get better. This might be a song before your time. And we wished each other a happy new era. New Labour certainly showed, for me, an example of the old maxim, the oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. And we see this uh, classically in 1997 and 2010. But you know, there's another thing for me, um, and that is an important lesson from the new Labour experience for any future government. It is that leadership does not own the party. It only rents it. The new Labour tenancy is well and truly over. To misquote the Monty Python team, new labour has passed on, it is no more, it has ceased to be, it has expired and gone to meet its maker, it has run down the curtain and joined the choir invisible, it is an ex-political movement. Thank you.